I'm Zach. I'm the CTO of uh, the Aztec Protocol. We're a privacy um, kind of provider for Ethereum and other public blockchains where we enable the creation of uh, private smart contracts on mainnet using zero knowledge cryptography and zero knowledge proofs. Um, and I'm here to, I want to uh, talk today about uh, a new universal uh, SNARK construction that um, we've been researching in collaboration with Protocol Labs called Plonk. Uh, getting a bit of bias and remorse on the name, I have to be honest. <laughs> but anyway, so. <laughs> Before diving into kind of the specifics about uh, Plonk Snarks and what, what, why, why I think they're useful, it uh, probably be helpful to kind of give a bit of an overview or just a bit of a summary of kind of the three flavors of Snark that exist. Um, uh, and when I, when I say Snark here, I'm also including Starks and other transparent um, constructions. Um, so you have the, 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 the non-universal setting where you have, um, that's where, uh, for example, like Growth16, where you have a... Uh, a trust is set up that you have to perform per, for every single circuit that you want to compile into a zero-knowledge proof. Um, this significantly helps efficiency, um, so proof construction is quite fast for these for these snarks, but you have large coordination problems having to manage this, this trusted setup ceremony. There are not many um, institutions and teams that can handle that. Um, and you also, you can get quite large, like the, the, the database that's produced in the setup can be very large and quite cumbersome to, to work with if you, um, for, large, for large circuits. So universal snarks were a kind of a, a response to the, some of the challenges that um, were faced when developing um, trusted setup snarks. And so in a universal snark, you need to perform, you still need to perform a trusted setup ceremony. You still need to um, create this reference stream which embeds structure that you can use to describe your, your algorithms, your circuits. But you only have to do it once. Um, and then you can take any arbitrary program and um, it, in a completely transparent manner, you can use that one trusted setup to create a a snark that's tailored to your circuit. Um, so this is obviously much uh, much more practical because then you, um, uh, you can have one one team, one company that creates this uh, trusted setup um, reference string, and then multiple teams can use it to, to make snark circuits. The reference string is also quite a bit smaller than non-universal snarks, although um, traditionally universal snarks have been quite a lot slower for proof construction than non-universal snarks, which is a problem. And then you have the transparent setting, where, which is the best of all when, for, for security, because you don't have any trusted setup at all. Um, and generally, proof sizes are rather snappy for these. Um, and you also have a small refer common reference string, so the, the database of cryptographic information that you need, not, not only is it transparent, but it's also small. Um, but you do pay with proof sizes, um, so they can range between the tens and hundreds of kilobytes, which on um, kind of data-constrained platforms like public blockchains, um, that can be a bit of a problem. Um, so the new, there has been a, kind of, a lot of research that's been happening over the past few months and a lot of announcements, and there's been this kind of new wave this year of SNARKs um, that are universal and are based around um, the, the polynomial commitment schemes. We're basic, effectively, stack construction is split into two phases. You generate this kind of reference string, which is updatable, and uh, it means you can, you can continuously um, add randomness and entropy into a reference string if you need it over time. Um, and then once you have this trusted setup, you then have this spe circuit specialization step uh, where you compile the zero knowledge proof. Um, that's kind of just a bit of a summary of the previous slide. So, <laughs> Plunk. Um, so, uh, technically, Plunk stands for permutations over large branch bases for ecumenical non interactive arguments of knowledge. Uh, yeah, uh, but to be honest, uh, uh, um, maybe one ulterior motive why I call it Plunk is because in England, Plunk is slang for cheap, low quality wine. And both Plonk and both consuming Plonk and thinking about Plonk give me a headache. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm glad that you've all, you're all here, so I can share, share some of the some of the joys of Plonk with you. Um, so, um, with Plonk, you, um, it doesn't follow a, a traditional like rank one constraint system structure, because when you're working in a universal setting, um, you you can't really get free addition gates, um, uh, which means that the rank, a rank one constraint system it, it, is a little bit difficult to work with. Um, so instead, we, our circuits are constructed uh, as an arithmetic circuit. So you have um, addition and multiplication gates where you, they're, they're fan in two, so you always have two input wires and one output wire. Um, however, uh, whilst addition gates aren't free, custom logic gates uh, can be, uh, where basically you can, you can embed um, little mini gates which have, which, um, have more, more uh, advanced functionality in them. So for example, you can do things like a MIMC hash round gate or elliptic curve point addition gate. Um, or um, uh, Boolean gates, which uh, constrain values to, to binary, binary numbers. And so what this is all just doing is it means that you can describe your circuits with fewer gates and therefore proof construction is faster uh, and more snappy. Um, 
And speaking of snappy, this is um, some benchmarks that we, we published with our proof of concept implementation. Um, so this is all very early stage, so we're working actively on improving these. But um, for even of circuits of 2 to the 20 uh, gates, um, the proof construction time is 23 seconds, less than 23 seconds. And this was run on a very ordinary uh, my, uh, laptop, a Surface, uh, Surface Pro 6, it doesn't even have a, doesn't even have a keyboard. Um, but we're quite, we're, we're quite hopeful about this because um, when you're working in a, a privacy-preserving setting where, where your, your, you, your clients are constructing zero-knowledge proofs uh, to um, you know, preserve, pr protect, pr preserve private information, then it usually means that those proofs of knowledge will have to be constructed on a local machine, so some, some computing hardware that, you're, that, 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 that an individual will have access to. Um, so that's unlikely to be a big, chunky 72-core AWS cluster. Yeah? So I just want to understand what's the difference between proof construction and circuit processing time? Like, what do you mean? Good question. Oh, so it's, it's a second pre-processing time. So that's the kind of the, the time taken to um, create your, compile your circuit um, once, you've, once you've written it. So you only have to do that once. Um, uh, to generate the keys? Yes, to generate the verification key. Um, so, so that's less than one proof time? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's fewer polynomials, uh, which is why. Um, and pre-verification time, because it's polylogarithmic, it's pretty tiny. It's 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 like it's less than it's like 1.4 milliseconds. Um, but with the million gates, you can describe quite a lot of advanced functionality. And to do it on a, on, a, on an average laptop in 20, uh, 23 seconds means that this open, hopefully when this technology is a bit more, is the library is a bit more advanced, um, it'll open up a very large uh, range of use cases for quite advanced circuits. Now you might think two to the 20 gates. Well, that sounds good, but gate, addition gates aren't free, so what does it actually get you? Well, that's where, that's where the... Ah, oh, oh dear. Oop. Okay, so just, uh, just to summarize, so for a fit, um, like, Plonk's pretty good at, and I'll get to this in a bit, why. It's very good at binary decomposition, uh, so like uh, taking in a, like a, a typed integer and splitting it, to its, uh, proving that you um, have something that's like um, within a range. <laughs> Um, things like hash algorithms that are sequential, like MIMC, where you're just kind of iteratively, sequentially processing data. Um, and it's great at elliptic curve primitives, like at elliptic curve point addition. Um, it's not so great for long, complicated linear relationships. Um, so particularly matrix um, arithmetic and hash algorithms that have a kind of a, a spinal construction like Poseidon or Rescue, so the new hash algorithms that have been produced by Starkware and affiliates. Um, so here are some kind of, uh, just to summarize the efficiency section, this is some kind of um, constraint counts for basic, for some simple operations. So here I've, I've got uh, basic plonk, where you just have additional multiplication gates, and something which for now working title, turbo plonk. Um, so this is uh, with some extra custom gate functionality that I'll, I, I'll, I can explain at the end of the talk, uh, later on in the talk. Um, but you can see for the turbo plonk scenario, where proof of efficiency will be like between like 10% like slower than basic plonk, so it's, it's barely, barely noticeable. Um, for common things like uh, binary decomposition, uh, you actually have half the number of constraints and you have bits in your number. You, uh, Booleans are free, so if you need a wire and your circuit to be one or zero, you get that for free. Uh, MIMC hashes at the 129 bit security level can be done on 48 gates only, uh, and you can do an entire elliptic curve point addition in two uh, constraints. Uh, and so this is. Can you explain again what the turbo plunk is? So turbo plunk is, is, is plunk with a little bit of extra. Um, uh, uh, some some more um, arithmetic in the verification equations. Um, so it basically, instead of instead of checking like you've satisfied uh, addition and multiplication gates, you check that you've also satisfied a set of Boolean gates uh, or elliptic curve primitive gates and MIMC gates. Um, but I should re uh, I'll, I'll get to why in a bit. But this doesn't actually this doesn't actually in increase prover runtime significantly because the prover doesn't have to um, provide any more commitments to the verifier. Um, to do this. It's basically you add more work into the pre-processing step um, to, to reduce prover time. And so yeah, these are, these are I believe, uh, quite better than Gross 16. Uh, and so theoretically, uh, although hopefully I'll have some comparison benchmarks soon, uh, this, can, this can, for relatively common circuits, this can be Gross 16. Um, so that's the kind of the high level efficiency <coughs> what Plunk does. Uh, so, so, um, so I'd like to go into a little bit about uh, how it does it. Uh, and some of the mechanics behind it, because I, I know this is quite like a diverse crowd. We have uh, quite quite like deep uh, theory cryptographers as well as um, people who are more interested in the application side. So uh, I'll try and keep this high level. I'll try. Please feel free to interrupt and interject with any questions um, if if I'm losing you. So if you want to make a universal snark, you need to 
you want to serve a proof of knowledge over uh, not some kind of weird mathematical like proof relation, but probably a program, right? That you want to want to run some kind of computer program and prove to people you've run it correctly, um, ideally obscuring some inputs. So you need a way of representing your program as an arithmetic circuit, because fundamentally what we're going to be doing is creating an algebraic expression that um, approximates to your program. Um, because uh, when you're work when working with uh, things like elliptic curve primitives, we know how to very succinctly, efficiently evaluate uh, complicated algebraic expressions um, uh, with, a, with tiny proof sizes and, and small, uh, uh, with a like, polyarithmetic prover time. We don't know so much how to do that when you, when the, when you have to verify a very long sequential list of operations, like, for example, in, um, the byte code of a computer program. So once you have your arithmetic circuit, so addition gates, multiplication gates, etc., you then need to uh, turn that circuit description into a polynomial relationship. So some kind of equation involving a bunch of polynomials. The reason why we want to do this is because we know how to succinctly commit to polynomials. Effectively, you can take a polynomial where kind of the complexity of your program is measured in the degrees of your polynomial, so the more terms you have in them. Uh, and you can compress all of that down into basically um, like, uh, into um, representations of the polynomial that uh, are constant sized no matter the degree. Um, and so for example, you can embed like a vector of a million variables into a polynomial and then perform uh, arithmetic on these polynomials as if they are, uh, but treating them still as if they're vectors. Um, uh, and so then, then find, I'm using a, some kind of commitment scheme to evaluate the, this polynomial relationship. So if a plot could be used, it's called I think KZG10, um, it's like the, the elliptic curve um, based polynomial commitment scheme, but there are others. You can use um, transparent polynomial commitment schemes based on IOPs, or the new work that's come out about groups of done unknown order with dark, um, or if you really want to, you can use transparent polynomial commitment schemes based on elliptic curves, but they aren't particular. They aren't very efficient. Um, so, uh, and yeah, this is. Uh, sorry, I skipped ahead a slide. Um, so yeah, this is uh, um, just summarizing that. Um, and so yeah, the, the Matter Labs guys uh, with uh, and Alex Sars have been have been tickering on with IAP based poly commitment schemes as well as fractals. So. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> so this is this is this is this is this is this is a slide. Um, <laughs> what I'm trying to show here is okay. So so in the title of our paper, we, we use this rather intimidating phrase Lagrange base. But what we really just mean with that, by that is we we want some kind of um, polynomial where over a selected over like a special predetermined um, <coughs> points on the x-axis, that polynomial is going to be either one or zero um, because we're going to be using this to construct some kind of vector representation of polynomials. And so that, um, these are called Lagrange polynomials. And um, those special x points, um, they are defined by picking a, a multiplicative subgroup. So this is just this is a, some, um, some group that's closed under multiplication. And so when working with um, Planck, SNARKs, or any other SNARK, to, to be honest, you're going to be that, that, that subgroup is just going to be the roots of unity. So um, yeah, just to, to go back on roots of unity. So OK. What are the roots of unity if you're working with real numbers? One, yes, and minus one. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all. Um, so when I say roots of unity, that might sound a bit weird, but basically um, uh, when you're working with prime, prime, we're working in prime fields, so everything is mo um, uh, like integers on the number line where everything wraps around in a very large prime number, so which means that, for example, you're probably going to be able to find some number when, when you power it, like say to the power of eight, it'll wrap around to one, and that'll be the eighth root of unity. And so for when constructing SNARKs, you, you pick a prime field um, that, has, that specifically has a very large number of roots of unity because they're, they're so important for constructing these kinds of proofs of knowledge. So um, with this, this multiplicative subject, so, so for example here, um, on this, in this graph, we have between x is between zero and nine, and you can see that these, this, these, and at least selection of polynomials that flash by um, the, the property that they have is that at one of those x-coordinates it'll be one, and at the rest they'll be zero. Um, and so replace those x-coordinates with roots of unity, and that's, um, that's, those are the Lagrange polynomials we use with Planck. The reason why these are useful is because they, they act like a delta function. Um, you, because when you, if, you, if you have some, uh, say for example, take the, the polynomial which is equal to one at x equals two, if you multiply a variable by that polynomial, then the resulting polynomial will be equal to your variable at x equals two, and it'll be equal to zero at all the other coordinates. Uh, points that, we, that, that matter. And so you can use this to, to um, represent a vector 
in a, as a polynomial um, because you take a say an, a vector with n elements and then you just multiply each element by one of the one of n Lagrange polynomials and then you have a polynomial when evaluated at one of those each of those special x coordinates will be equal to an element in your vector. Um, this is a very neat way of representing information date, date vectors as polynomials because uh, yeah isn't yeah um, uh, th so this isn't, isn't as as is a little bit more cluttered than I would have liked, but effectively, what you can um, in, when you encode um, your vectors in this form, then vector arithmetic is preserved um, because any any kind of relationship with your vector that held, held with your vectors will also hold over the polynomials. So to give an example here, if you have like um, uh, a base, the, the, one of the basics, not uh, like a multiplication gate, where you have uh, s some variable a multiplied by some variable b, and then you add some variable c, and you expect that all to be equal to zero. If that holds for every single vector element in a, b, and c and then you encode a, b, and c as polynomials, then the resulting polynomial arithmetic, when you multiply a of x by c of x and then add c, a of x by b of x and add c of x to it, the result will be, well, you'll get a polynomial where at every single one of those special x coordinates, it'll be equal to zero. It'll cut through the, the y-axis. And so, um, uh, so yeah, so here, yeah, I should change the colors. I'm really sorry if you're colorblind. Uh, the red one is a of x, the blue one is b of x, and the orange one is c of x. Uh, and the yellow one is the result of a of x times b of x plus c of x. And you can maybe see that the yellow one will cut through the x, um, the, the, the axis at all of the um, points. Um, and so just in an extremely similar manner to, to Stark's, this is useful for us because then if you want to check some kind of uh, arithmetic represent, uh, identity over the vectors, we just need to perform the relevant arithmetic on the polynomials and then check that it's zero modulo the vanishing polynomial of your group. Effectively, you just you find the lowest degree polynomial that will cut through the y-axis at all of these special x coordinates, and you know that your your the arithmetic polynomial you're evaluating that will be perfectly divisible by the vanishing polynomial if and only if the arithmetic expression that you're checking over your vectors holds. Um, and this is fundamentally what we do with Planck, and it's um, and this is useful because it means that if your vectors have like millions of elements in them, you've just found a way of uh, evaluating uh, millions of little mini equations with one single equation. So, speaking of circuits, um, uh, we need them. Uh, we need gates, right? If you're if you're going to turn a snark into a, a pro turn a program into a snark, and so we have additional multiplication gates, uh, where um, we use selector vectors um, to kind of um, to, to turn on or off gates. So the idea is you you have these these Q values. Is this a pointer? A hey. um, Q values. Um, so those are basically they're they're, they're formed in the preprocessing step. So when you're creating your circuit, uh, they're, they're defined ahead of time, like compile time constants, um, which will be scaling up like wire values up or down by constants. If you need them, we're turning off wire values, um, and the W values will be committed by the prover. And so this is just some basic expressions which can evaluate multiplication and addition, um, but. This also means that you can turn off a gate completely by setting all of its selectors to zero, which means, in turn, you can combine these two gates into a combined addition and multiplication gate, where we just take those selectors from selector ve vectors from before and just mash them into one single equation. And then if you want to make this an addition gate, you just set QM to zero. And if you want to make it a multiplication gate, you'll set QL and QR to zero. Um, and so once we have this way of evaluating a gate using vectors, well, we can then just warp it into polynomial land by using those Lagrange polynomials. And then this vector arithmetic expression will then be uh, mapped directly onto this, the equivalent polynomial uh, evaluation, which will be equal to zero modulo the vanishing polynomial. So what does that get us? Well, that gets us a way of evaluating a large number of arithmetic gates at once. But those are, you have no way of, at the moment, um, forming some, any kind of relationship between the gates. We just have a bunch of isolated gates and we can go, yeah, okay, fine, the wires going into and out of the gates, like they, there's some relationship holds between them. But you can't describe any meaningful, useful circuit with this because you need to be able to evaluate, um, basically you need to be able to check that certain wires from some, once some gates connect to wires and other gates. You need to check that the, any, when, a, when, a, when a wire splits and feeds into two different gates, that this wire value is genuinely the same as this wire value and that the prover hasn't cheated and provided two different wire values for these gates when they're supposed to be the same. Um, so we call these copy relationships. And so the question is, how do you check the copy relationships? And this is the hard bit. This is the bit which was, is the, was and is the bane of universal snarks because um, uh, it's exceptionally difficult to do without resorting to kind of quadratically sized reference strings or uh, punitive pu prover times. That, that would be 
Pardon? That would be like analogous to, have to getting universal snarks by mm. using universal circuits. Yes, um, w yeah, which is another, yeah. Yeah, it's like blow up. Yes, yeah. This is, this is like the Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so yeah, yeah, it's basically generally, like if you, if you would approach it naively, what you would need to do is you need to basically have a, um, uh, you'd have to have a bivariate polynomial um, uh, to, to represent both like the gate checks and the wire copy checks. And then uh, that means you have order n squared to prove a time, and that's just deeply unpleasant. Um, but so instead, we, we solved the problem by using a permutation. Um, originally, I think it was in the paper from Bayer and Groth in 2012. And so what a permutation will do is effectively, what, it allows us to check copy that, co uh, that wire values have been correctly copied. So here's a bit of a toy example. So imagine we have five wires. So the, the numbers are indices, um, and the colors are the values of the wires. Um, so this was uh, a helpful example uh, that was helpfully put together by, by Mary Mallow when I was rack, rack, racking my head wondering how on earth to explain this stuff. Basically, um, what we can do is if we, we, if, if we have basically this set of wires uh, with, with these assigned values, then if we want to check that, that wires 1, 4, and 5 are the same so that they are green, what we can do is basically permute the, the, the wire indices. So now we basically say, okay, this, what used to be wire number 1, it's now not wire number 5. And what used to be wire number 4, it's now wire number 1. And what's wire number 5? It's now wire number 4. And check that those permuted blocks still have the same color. So if we, if, we, if we kind of move the, the fifth wire into the first wire's position, will it, will it match? Um, this is why we call it permutation, because you're kind of jiggling around the, uh, the, um, the, the, like the, the wire index, index values. And so, the, ooh, dear, sorry, I uh, should, <laughs> should have checked the formatting. So the plot permutation check. Um, what we do to, to do this um, check is we, we use some, uh, some randomness that will be provided by the verifier in the interactive setting. In the non-interactive setting, it'll be from a hash function where we take each wire value and we kind of, we mix it in with the wires index position in the circuit. So that should have, there should, that I shouldn't, okay. So, so basically we have, so for example, Z1 it represents kind of um, like the original wire mixing values and Z2 represents the permuted wire mixing values. What we do is we, we take the wire value, we mix it in with the wire index, but we multiply the wire index by some random beta and then we add some random gamma onto the top of it. The reason why this is useful is because, well, um, what you get from that is you'll get a vector of z values um, for both the like the uh, original case, which we call the identity permutation, and then the the permuted case, the copy permutation. And the point is that um, you'll you'll get like a, a set of um, points where both of these z1 and z2 so they should have the same points but in a mixed up order. So to give an example, imagine uh, one and four they need to uh, one and five they need to be the same, right? So uh, in Z1, you'll have the first Y value plus beta, because I'll be 1 plus gamma. And in the fifth Y value, you'll have W5 plus 5 beta plus gamma. Uh, and then in Z2, you'll have W5 plus beta plus gamma. And uh, you'll have W1 plus 5 beta plus gamma. So effectively, you, if W1 isn't equal to W5, then you'll, have, you'll be off by a factor of 4 beta. Um, and because you commit the Y values before you're given beta, you can't, um, you can't like fiddle with your wire values and uh, add factors of beta or, oh, sorry, beta or gamma into them uh, to, 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 to fake a permutation check. And the reason why we need two bits of randomness is because the beta ensures effectively that you have, um, it ensures that, you, that it forces the prover to provide a set of permuted values um, that are in a permutation of the original wires, but not the permutation actually prescribed by the circuit. That's where the gamma comes in. Um, but if you have any questions about this after the talk, I'm very happy to, to go over it in a bit more detail. Um, the overall arithmetic check we want to do is effectively we take the product of all these terms. If, if all the Z1 values and all the Z2 values are supposed to be identical but in a different order, then if we just multiply them all together, then the ratio should be equal to 1. Um, and so then that's... <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, this was supposed to be a toy example. Um, what was I thinking? Um, okay, so... Well, let's 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 sort let's grin through it. Um, so, if you have uh, your green value is five, your blue value is ten, and your 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 black wire is two, then um, if you so the, in the identity permutation, you'll have um, it'll be like uh, you'll have a vector. It'll, it'll say just one, two, three, four, five, and the permutation vector is five, two, three, one, four, because five values five, uh, values one, and values four need to be the same. And so you've you've um, you've kind of um, rotated the indices around, and so. Basically, what you can see from here is, like, say, the first value in Z1, it'll be 5 plus 1 beta plus gamma, 
because it's the first, because um, it's the, wait, yes. Yeah, because you have the first y value is five and then you have it's mapped to index one and then you add a gamma to the top. And at the very end, uh, you have the same y value, five plus five beta plus gamma, because this is the fifth y index. And then you can see what we've done here is we've moved this term round to the first term. We've taken the first y value and added five beta to it and then added a gamma. And so if this first y value isn't the same as the fifth y value, then these integers aren't going to match. And so you're going to have different coordinates. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and so that's kind of the, 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 the gist of how this, how this works. And if you just take the product of z1 and you take the product of z2, they should match, and therefore the ratio should equal 1. So, bleh. So, yeah. To wrap my head around that quickly, mm. by putting abstract words, like you have like a, all the elements of like the permutation group of some order, mm. and you just want to permute it yeah. so that you have all the elements again, but in a different order. Precisely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you said um, the, the product being equal means the ratio is 1. Does that still hold if the denominator is 0? Uh, no, so you need to check the denominator isn't zero. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you need to explicitly check that um, because uh, yeah, otherwise you have problems. Um, so we can encode this permutation vector as a polynomial, but we have a bit of a problem because we need to take the product of all of these terms. And each one of those individual terms, if you go back to here, in polynomial land, uh, effectively you're going to have a polynomial which, when evaluated, so if you, for example, if you have the, a, a polynomial that represents the left y values and the right y values and the output y values, then you can create a polynomial where effectively, when evaluated at like the first root of unity, you'll get this bit, and evaluated at the second root of unity, you'll get this bit, and the third, you'll get this bit, and so on. But then how do you, how do you multiply them all together? Um, because creating relationships between different evaluation points of the same polynomial is really hard, um, because we can't, we, we, want to, we don't want to evaluate this polynomial loads of times, hundreds of times, because then you don't have a fast, succinct prover. Uh, and the proof sizes start to explode. So what we can do is, this is a bit of a weird, so what we do is um, this, the polynomial you commit to, effectively at each su successive evaluation point, um, you get a kind of accumulating product. So at the first evaluation point, when at the first root of unity, this will just be equal to one, because you have the first Lagrange polynomial here. And then at the second root of unity, it'll be equal to one of the product terms. So you'll take the first y value, and take its kind of permuta identity permutation, and you divide the first y value by its copy permutation. And then that'll be the, the second uh, root of unity. And, so, and then at the third root of unity, you'll have the previous value of z multi um, multiplied by the next product term, and so on and so forth. And so at the final root of unity for your subgroup, um, you will have z of x will be equal to kind of the grand product of all of, all of your permutation terms, except for the very last term. Because the idea is then if you take the, if you take the final, uh, if you take the evaluation point of, the, of, your, of z at, at, at the last subgroup element, and then you multiply on the missing terms, you should get, it should be equal to 1, which is the same value as the first evaluation of z of x, uh, uh, evaluated at the first root of unity. So you have this kind of wraparound effect, um, which is what we use to kind of check, to, um, check the whole grand product equation. Effectively, what we want to do is say the next evaluation of z is going to be equal to the current evaluation multiplied by um, like the, the, the current iteration of the grand product um, thing, term. Um, but then this, again, creates another problem. Because, well, we, want to, we now want to compare like, the evaluation of z at one root of unity with the evaluation of z at the next root of unity. Effectively, when z is encoded as a vector, we want to perform a right shift on this vector. But it's not, not a vector, it's a, it's a polynomial. So how, how, do we, how do we do that? <laughs> that was um, not something, something I had absolutely no idea how to do. I was, um, the reason why Planck became a thing is because I was, I was talking to Ara Gabazon at a, at a workshop a few, a few months ago. Um, I asked him this problem for, for, at a diff for a different use case because I, I wasn't really thinking of Planck. I was thinking of something else. But I thought, oh, this problem can't be done. It's like, man, but I might as well ask Ariel. He's, you know, he's, he, he, he found the Zcash bug. So he's, he's pretty much the, the top of the game. Um, um, and then the next day he came back to me and he was like, oh yeah, by the way, I, mean, I solved that problem that you had, it's really easy. <laughs> um, and so it is really simple, I'm not sure it's easy. Effectively, if you have a polynomial um, where at, evaluated at the successive roots of unity is equal to some value, then if you take the same polynomial and evaluate it at x is equal to, you evaluate it at um, basically x multiplied by a, a pr the primitive root of unity, then if z of x, if z of like, uh, if omega is the primitive of unity, and if, if, if z of omega equals like the first y value, and uh, or like the first witness, and then z of omega squared equals the second witness. So effectively, 
what this will do is, if you take the same polynomial, but you just change the evaluation point by multiplying it by the primitive root of unity, you will act, be accessing uh, the, the next element in your vector compared to the original polynomial, which is a right shift, which is what you need. So if you go back to the previous equation, this thing, um, so what we've done is we multiplied out the denominator up into the left-hand side because dividing by polynomials is rather hard. Um, and what we have instead is we take, so z of x omega is the grand product polynomial at the next evaluation, at the, like at the, um, at the next vector element. And we multiply by the denominator of the, the current grand, grand product term. And then we take, compare that with the grand product polynomial at the current evaluation point uh, and multiply it by the numerator of the grand, the, the grand product term we need to multiply it by. And so, um, and that should be equal to zero because effectively that's just, that's this equation, but um, the, the denominator kind of multiplied out and in polynomial form. So if we can check that basically successive evaluations of, yes? You're right, entirely right, it's a rotation by one. It wraps around at the start. Uh, yeah. Which is what you wanted. Yes, it is exactly what we wanted. If it was a shift, we'd have a problem. Um, so if we, have, if, we, if we know that the kind of next grand product term is, is contained, like the successive grand product terms are contained within z of x, then if we can evaluate that, and then we just need to check that z of x starts at one, so that at the first root of unity, um, z of x will evaluate to one, which also means then that the last grand product term will be equal to one, if the first one is, because it, it, it'll wrap around because of this equation. And then we know that the the, none of the denominators are going to be equal to zero because we've, we've primed it to start at one and therefore um, you, you can never, a, a malicious prover can never make any of these z of x terms equal to zero. Uh, and that's the permutation. That's really the, the uh, oh God, let's hide that for a bit. Um, uh, that, that was the, 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 the kind of the key contribution of Planck that, that made it a, a, a succinct, quite efficient universal snark. Yes. Um, can you go back to the example and show why you need both beta and gamma? Because I didn't quite get that. Okay, so okay, so let's take a. I'm wondering if we could take a toy. I wish I had mm, uh, something to draw. <laughs> uh, okay, fine. So let's let's give a proper proper permutation. So we have um, we have what three three y values that need to be the same. So let's say they are equal to um, three. Sorry, well, three, three, and three, they need to be the same numbers, don't they? And let's make it a nice power of two, so, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah, good point, okay. So let's make this, these four, four, and four. We have three wires. And so we have here four plus uh, beta. So I'm ignoring the gamma term now because I'm hopefully I can actually be a competent malicious prover and fake this proof now. Uh, four plus three beta. And then let's say the permutation will map one to two, two to three, three to one. So we have four plus three beta, four plus beta, and four plus two beta. Is that right? Probably not, but it's a permutation, so it, matters. it doesn't matter. Okay, so now I'm a malicious prover. So I'm saying, okay, I don't want to play by the rules. Uh, this is now equal to eight. And I need these two to match. And so this now will, uh, will be equal to eight. So we have eight plus three beta and eight plus beta, so clearly, we're, bit, we're off by a term here, right? So we're going to have here, effectively, we have an extra, we have an extra factor of two beta. <laughs> ah, yes, uh, two, mm, left-handed. Okay, two beta multiplied by four plus beta, multiplied by four plus two beta. But now, because we're off by just a factor of beta, well, I can probably now change one of my, one of my additional term y values in here to kind of compensate for that. So, for example, if I change, hmm, can I do this? Uh, let's say that this is equal to, what would happen if I made this, so you have eight plus beta, four plus two beta. So let's make this two. And then let's make this, uh, oh, um, <laughs> uh, make this one. Now, this probably won't work at all, um, but, mm, okay, mental arithmetic is my strong suit. What I've completely failed to show here, what I was trying to show, is that if you only have the beta term, you, you can, if you, if you have a fluency in mental arithmetic, which I lack, you'll be able to create ratios between the three wire values, such that these products will, will be equal to one another. Um, oh, we're not a constant term means that you can't create ratios. Exactly, because if you had a constant term, then, then, then you, you, you've got some ratio, but you've suddenly thrown a constant into the numerator and denominator that you can't control. 
Um, so yeah, um, apologies for the for the uh, questionable uh, uh, the questionable mathematics here. Um, yeah, so um, it's not moon math at all. It's apparently it's no maths. But yeah, that's kind of why how a little bit about maybe provides a bit of intuition about the permutation that you can if you just have one random value, you can create ratios between the y values that aren't what the circuit creator intended, and then but adding in the gamma factor means that you you kind of you you add a constant term into that ratio, which kind of uh, breaks the, ratio, the, the fake ratios. So this, oh, this is nasty, and I have one minute left. So basically, this is just the, so I mentioned before everything is equal to zero modulo a vanishing polynomial. Um, so, uh, well, to check that something zero equal, is equal to zero mod something else, you need, you need the quotient polynomial. You need to present a, person, a polynomial that will be, you, you will multiply the, the vanishing polynomial by to equal your original expression. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try even try and explain this, but basically, um, the arithmetic term is here, and these are the two permutation terms. Uh, and the thing, uh, the thing I want to try and communicate about this is basically, no matter how many checks, verification checks that the, the verifier has to do, um, as long as everything is equal to zero modulo the vanishing polynomial, they can just add, you can just add extra terms into the quotient polynomial by just multiplying them by some random separator so that they can be treated as independent. Um, and the kind of the final takeaway from this is the prover will need to commit to five polynomials. They will all be degree n, where n is the number of gates, apart from t of x, which will be degree 3n, plus two extra group elements of degree n for the KZG10 polynomial opening proofs. But long story short, the prover costs are dominated by group 9n group exponentiations, where n is the number of constraints in your circuit. So this is quite competitive with things like Groth, where it's uh, like 3n plus m plus uh, then n g2 elements. The fact that this is all g1 helps a lot. Um, so, are we done yet? Well, I think I think I want to say no, but I think I think the answer might be yes from everybody else. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to do, just provide a little bit of intuition behind customer gates before I finish. Um, so, if you just have additional multiplication gates, you know, blah, that's quite boring. How about turning that into this? This is much more interesting and, and, and much less less understandable. I worry, I fear. Ba basically, because you are evaluating in the, with in this quotient polynomial, you are uh, yeah. Oh God. Um, you're evaluating z of x at two evaluation points somewhere here. z of x here and then z of x. Because you're evaluating one polynomial at two evaluation points, because you can batch polynomial opening proofs together, um, you, can, you can access the next y values in, in, the, in the subsequent gate, um, which means you can get access to additional y's in your circuit, and you can do things like um, Boolean checks and be free, you can do mimic hash functions, and you can do elliptic point addition by basically just adding in extra equations into that quotient polynomial. So this one, this one, I, I don't really have time to go through them, but um, you can you can basically you can add custom functionality um, in, into the verification equation, and, and you can basically get it for free by just adding more pre-processed selected polynomials. Um, and then finally, yeah, uh, speaking of trusted setups, we're running one right now. Um, it's uh, it's been going for five days, and uh, we've got. Uh, over 300 signups, and you're more, there's, there's some space you're more than welcome to apply. Uh, at, just head to our website, and hopefully, this will be a kind of a common good that the community can use for uh, universal snark circuits or Planck circuits um, that has a high degree of confidence around its uh, security, given the number of people participating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah. I know we would all like to be doing the math with you. We, we do have to. Uh, yes, yes, sorry, I overran. Uh, yeah. I do encourage everyone to come to the uh, London workshop, which is where we really have the discussions and we go deep into the map and everybody can uh, question every single plus and minus uh, on the board. So uh, I'll just say that maybe we have one question, maybe a high level question or higher level question. Um, does anybody have a question? Okay. <laughs> what, uh, what proof systems does this Aztec um, MVC support? So it supports it was originally designed for our original like um, Aztec Sigma protocol range, proof, range proofs, but it also serendipitously can be used for Planck proofs of knowledge, and I believe it can be used for Marlin proofs. Um, but uh, and anything that uses the KCGJ and polynomial commitment scheme, it can, can also use uh, use the Planck setup. Use it uh, with BN two five four. Yes, yes, it's BN two five four, the old Zcash curve, because that's the one that Ethereum precompiles support. Let's say Zag one more time. Yeah.